Good day. And today we're going to be looking at uh, the first half of the book of Ezekiel. And this is a message um, where we're going to be looking at Ezekiel's message, the message that God gives Ezekiel. Uh, we're going to look at sin, the idea of sin, and also the hope of restoration that Ezekiel is given. So firstly, the message. Um, so the book begins um, in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and it says this. In the thirteenth year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, I was among the exiles of the Kabar River, and the heavens opened, and I saw a divine vision. On the fifteenth day of the month, it was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile, the Lord's message came to the priest Ezekiel, the son of Buzi, at the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. The hand of the Lord came upon him there. So just you know, like reading here in the first three verses, we can see that obviously we've got the voice of Ezekiel, uh, but we've also got the voice of the editor as well, the person who compiled the book and you know brings it to us in its final form as well. So uh, verse one is Ezekiel's own perspective he's it's in the first person i was among the exiles and then verse two and three is the perspective of the of the editor who says the lord's message came to the priest ezekiel okay so we've got these two perspectives here and so um that's just to acknowledge that fact at the very beginning so Ezekiel here has a vision and he sees the throne chariot of god it's a symbolic representation of God is the Lord over the heavens. And so the four animals here correspond to the four corners of the zodiac. And God is enthroned over the four corners of heaven, over all that is. So the bull is Taurus, the lion is Leo, the man is Aquarius, and the eagle is Aquilus. And so there's the four corners of heavens there, the north, the south, the east and the west. And the Lord God presides over it all. He is the one reigning over all he's enthroned over the heavens and the earth and you've got the eyes that are the stars etc so you've got all this symbolic language that's trying to uh, symbolic visionary language to try and depict the the reality that is that god is above all and supreme over all so we've got ezekiel chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 so he said to me son of man stand on your feet and i will speak with you and as he spoke a wind came into me and it stood upon my feet and I heard the one speaking to me. He said to me, son of man, I'm sending you to the house of Israel, to rebellious nations who've rebelled against me. Both they and their fathers have revolted against me to this day. The people to whom I'm sending you are obstinate. They're hard hearted. And you must say this is what the sovereign Lord says. And he's given a scroll to eat. And he becomes God's agent in the world. And that's often the way that God speaks to us is through agents, through through individuals who act on his behalf. We, you know, going back to earlier chapters, as it were, we see in Exodus 7 verse 1, we read that Moses says, So the Lord said to Moses, See, I've made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. So Moses becomes God to Pharaoh. He acts in the place of God as God's agent. And the stuff that Moses does, we say God does. And the stuff that God does, we see Moses doing. Okay, so he's acting in the place of God. It's Moses who leads Israel up out of Egypt, but we say it is God who led Israel up out of Egypt. Okay, because he's acting through his agent. And Moses here, uh, Moses is the agent of God, and here Ezekiel is called to act as God's agent, to, to represent God to his people as a human messenger. He's called the Son of Man. He, you're, you're a man, you're a man, and you're acting in the place of God here. And so Ezekiel eats a scroll, and symbolically he's ingesting the word of God. It becomes a part of him, it goes down into him. And so therefore the words that he speaks are God's words, to his people you know as he breathes out the words of god uh, the word of god is how god speaks isn't it you know in the beginning um let there be light and there was light so the word of god is god's spoken word um so he ingests it and then it comes forth from him so ezekiel chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 at the end of the seven days the lord's message came to me son of man i've appointed you as a watchman over the house of israel 
wherever you hear a word from my mouth, you must give them a warning from me. So here Ezekiel's given part of his calling. He's to look out for his fellow Israelites, to call them back into repentance whilst they're living in exile in the land of Babylon, in Iraq, modern day Iraq. Uh, this message is renewed. Um, so in Ezekiel 33, uh, verse 11, we say, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but prefer that the wicked change his behaviour and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil deeds. Why should you die, O house of Israel? So the message that Ezekiel brings is a message of repentance, turning back, turning back to God. Return to God, return to the sovereign Lord. Live as he who has commanded you to live in his law, in the Torah. Return again to the Lord God. Submit to him and to his way of life. Do not go after the, the gods of the nations, the, these idols or demons, but rather submit to the Lord God. Uh, and we follow our Messiah who gives a similar message. So Matthew records Jesus saying in Matthew 4, 17, From that time on, Jesus began to preach this message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So part of Jesus' own message is repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay, you want a part in the kingdom in the age to come? Repent, turn back to God, turn away from your idols, from these other things, from your sinning life, and live in under God's law. Okay, so Paul, uh, likewise, when he's in Athens and he's speaking to the Greek philosophers, he says in Acts 17, verse 29 to 31. So since we are God's offspring, we should not think the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human skill or imagination. Therefore, though God has overlooked such time of ignorance, he now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he's designated having provided proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. So Ezekiel was to act as God's agent in calling his Israelites back to God to warn the nations the judgment is coming. And we have a similar calling. As Paul said to the Greeks, he now commands all people everywhere to repent, to come back to God, because he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he's designated, having provided proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. So God has designated a man, a man through whom he will judge the world. And the proof that he's designated him this way is the resurrection of the dead. And so we can say that it is Jesus, the Messiah. He is the one who will rule and he is the one who will judge in the age that is to come. And God's provided the proof. He's shown to everyone that he has chosen this man by raising him from the dead. That's Paul's point. He wants them to grasp this. And, and they hear about the resurrection and they're like, what? <laughs> what is this? Um, so in order to convey the message... Um, that Ezekiel has to bring, he, he resorts to some visual aids. He, he acts them out. He dramatizes uh, the message that he has to bring. So these Ezekiel 4 to 5, uh, particularly Ezekiel's sign acts. So he has to act out certain things. So the first thing he does is play with toy soldiers. You know, it's a games workshop in 600 BC, as it were. You know, so it's the, the first uh, version of Warhammer 40,000. Um, so Ezekiel in Ezekiel 4 verses 1 to 2 he says, And you, son of man, take a brick, set it up in front of you, inscribe a city on it, Jerusalem, and lay siege to it, build siege work against it, erect a little siege ramp against it, post soldiers outside and station battering rams around it. So he's got a brick, he writes Jerusalem on it, and then he creates all these little toy soldiers and tries to act out a siege of Jerusalem. And God's sort of trying to say through this message about what is going to happen to Jerusalem. So he's got a number of other things that he has to do, stand and stare at an iron frying pan. He lies on his left side 
to bear the iniquity of Israel for 390 days. And then he lies on his right side as well to bear the iniquity of Judah for 40 days. Uh, he cooks food over dung. Uh, he shaves his head and then has to cut the hair into the wind so it blows away. Um, and this leads me into my second point, which is to talk about sin. Ezekiel is called in his capacity as God's agent, his representative here, to quote, bear the iniquity or bear the sins of the nation. Uh, Jesus does this in a greater degree in that he bears the sin or bears the iniquity of the whole earth, the whole world in a once for all time sort of way. But Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 4.4, 4, we read this, then lie on your left side, put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days that you lie on your side. So notice the language here that Ezekiel told. He says, put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. He is to carry, to bear Israel's sin. He was a priest before the exile, so he's familiar with this sort of arrangement as the, the priests bore the sin of the Levites and the others in the tribe to make sure that there was no sin in the camp. So Ezekiel is told to lie on his left side for 390 days and it represents 390 years bearing the guilt of the entire covenant community of Israel north and south and the sin the iniquity of the people is placed upon him and this symbolizes the long history of rebellion which ends in the siege and the fall of Jerusalem and then he lies on his right side for 40 days as a symbolic period of a wilderness going out into the desert of wandering for into the wilderness just as Israel's ancestors uh, had a lost generation where they had to wander again for 40 years in the wilderness for their disobedience because of their sin so the exilic generation is condemned to a similar fate in the nation's long history of sin there's going to be 40 years as it were, a symbolic period of a wilderness period that now Judah is facing because of their sin. Okay, they're going into exile, into the desert once more, before they return to the promised land. And the term to, to bear the iniquity or to bear the sin includes accepting responsibility and the consequence of the sin of others. And that the Satasset did fall upon the priests. So in Exodus uh, 28 38 and numbers 18 verse 1 and the idea of substitution being passed over here from the priestly realm into the prophetic ministry is because Ezekiel here is acting on behalf as God as God's agent and these ideas obviously find their their final climatic sort of uh, sort of um, in Isaiah 53 the suffering servant who for Christians is the Lord Jesus Christ um, so he's the one who takes the iniquity, the sins of the whole earth upon himself um, and takes them and bears them on behalf of the world. So Isaiah 53 verse 11, after he suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous servant will justify the many and he will bear their iniquity. So it's just the same phrase here is that he's going to bear their iniquities. He, he's the one who bears our iniquities. Okay. So in First John chapter 2, verse 2, we read, He himself is the intoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. Uh, so just as Ezekiel here acts as God's agent, he eats and digests the word of God so that when he speaks out, he speaks God's word. Here he carries Israel's sin. He bears their iniquities. And Jesus does this in, in an even greater way. He's the one to the max. He's the, the one, the final one who does it for all time, once for all, you know, for all time in all places. OK, as it were, a greater way. And he takes on Israel's sin and also the sin of the whole world. Um, and so in Hebrews chapter 10, verses um Verses 12 and 13. And when this priest had offered one sacrifice for the sins of all time, he sat down at the right hand of God, where he's now waiting until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. For by the one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being made holy. 
So here we're, we're told that Jesus acts as our, our priest, our great high priest, and he acts in a once for all sacrifice. And he's now sat down next to God, at God's right hand, um, and he's waiting to come into his kingdom until all of his enemies are made a footstool underneath him. OK, so then he's going to come, he's going to rule and reign uh, with his saints, with his followers, his chosen disciples. OK, so let's turn to the last point now, which is hope, hope. So Ezekiel here has a, a series of visions of the temple in which he sees a lot of idolatry going on. And then the glory of God departing from the temple. And he speaks of judgment, but also hope for the future. In Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 17 to 21, it says there, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, And I will regather you from all the people and assemble you in the lands in which you've been dispersed. I will give you back the country of Israel. And then they return to it. They will be removed from it, all of its detestable things, all of its abominations. I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. I'll remove the hearts of stone from their body and I will give them tender hearts so they may follow my statues, observe my regulations and carry out. Then they will be my people and I will be their God. But those whose hearts are devoted to detestable things, to abominations, I hereby repay them for what they have done, says the sovereign Lord. So these ideas uh, are rooted all the way back in the writings of Moses. Uh, but it's the idea that God will instill his spirit but that we need something internal in order to change us so that we can fulfill the will of god in our lives so deuteronomy 30 verses 5 to 6 it says this he will bring you into the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of you he will take he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors and the lord your god will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you will love him with all of your heart with all of your soul and live okay so the, the need that even Moses predicted in, in their predicting their, their wickedness, their idolatry, he says that there's going to be a need for an internal change, not just an external one. The stony heart needs to be changed into a heart of flesh. Okay, They need to be born again, to use the language of Jesus. They need a real change of heart on the inside. And uh, Jeremiah calls this the new covenant. He says in Jeremiah 31, 33, 34, but I will make a new covenant with the whole nation of Israel and I will plant them back in the land, said the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and on their minds. I will be their God and they will be my people. People will no longer need to teach their neighbours and relatives to know me. For all of them, from the least important to the most important, will know me, says the Lord. For I will forgive their sin and I will no longer call to mind the wrong that they have done. So the Torah, the law of God, is going to be written upon their hearts and their sins will be forgiven and will no longer be called to mind for the, the wrongs that they've done. Isn't that wonderful that God will no longer call to mind the wrong that you've done, the wrong that I've done, that it's not going to be upon his mind, but rather he forgives us because of the work of Christ for us upon the cross. All of this finds its fulfilment in the suffering servant, in Jesus the Messiah. And he brings this new covenant by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And that each of us needs this change of heart um, that Ezekiel spoke about in his word. He says here, Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 19 to 20. I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their bodies and I will give them tender hearts. So they will follow my statues, observe my regulations and carry them out. And they will be my people and I will be their God. It's a wonderful thought, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that the, the one God has brought us to himself and that he changes our hearts. He changes us on the inside by his spirit so that we can become more and more like his Messiah. So he puts his spirit in us so that we might follow his teachings and carry them out and we can live his life in the world. Um, so we can't do it without him. We can't do it on our own. We need him to work within us, to change our desires and our behaviour by his spirit. So in conclusion, as Ezekiel has in his message, so do we. 
to call everyone to a knowledge of the truth, to submit to Jesus as God's chosen Messiah and Lord. He's proved it. God has proved that this is the one by raising him from the dead. This is my chosen one. I am going to raise him from the dead. And just as Ezekiel bore the sins of Israel, so the Messiah has borne the sins not only of Israel, but also of the whole earth once and for all time. That's wonderful news, isn't it? It's wonderful news that he doesn't count your sin against you anymore, but rather he counts you as clean. That though you were as scarlet, now you are as white as snow. Once for all time. And this high priestly ministry that Jesus continues to, to have as he sat there at God's right hand. Ministering for us. Pleading for us before God. So having removed sin from us, he now pours the spirit of God into our hearts. Friends, let's ask for more of God's spirit today. That he might make you new. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would send your spirit into our hearts in a fresh way. Bring us more and more of that revelation. We pray of yourself. Remove all of our sins from us. And we thank you for the work of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has saved us and redeemed us and made us new. That we might have life in his kingdom in the age to come. Amen.